Hip-hop is 1987.com. Hip Hop since 1987. We're live in Atlanta right now, Main Street Studios. And I had the honor and the pleasure of, of speaking with and picking the brain of a young lady who's been in the game for some time. And quite honestly, if you don't know your fa her face and you're in the blogger sphere or you do anything written in the hip hop world, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. She goes by the name of Julia Beverly. How are you doing today? I'm good. Now, for those who may not know, as I just gave mention to you, you've been contributing in the hip-hop world for some time. You're one of the founders or the founder of o Ozone Magazine. For those who don't know, Ozone Magazine was the first magazine highlighting hip-hop and artists in the South. So talk to me a little bit about your journey and how you started your magazine. Um, I actually started as a photographer, and that was always my passion was photography, shooting like concerts and, and different events. And originally, Ozone was going to be like a portfolio, like showing off my work and hopefully, you know, getting a job somewhere else. And it didn't happen that way. It, it ended up um, that Ozone kind of came along at the right place at the right time. And at that time, you know, the South was really on the come up. There were a lot of artists that were kind of building an underground movement that hadn't really been exposed yet. Um, you know, the, the, the Young Jeezys, the Slim Thugs, the Rick Rosses, guys like that that were building a fan base, but nobody, you know, on a national level really was aware of it yet. So we kind of played a role in breaking a lot of those artists and, you know, kind of shining a light on the movements that were happening in the South. Now, how did you fall in love with hip-hop? When, when you were coming up in the world, did you have a love for hip-hop? Is this something that you grew to love later later on in life? When did you, you know, actually find a love for hip-hop? And when did you decide that you wanted to capture fit, uh, capture moments in hip-hop and document them? Uh, originally, it was Outkast that first put me on to hip-hop. I was kind of more into the, you know, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, stuff my friends were listening to in high school. And um, I, had a, I had an art class with a guy who sat next to me that would just play Outkast, like, on repeat constantly and it was like you know what is that that's kind of it's kind of dope so that was originally uh, outcast and tupac was kind of my original you know introduction to the world of hip-hop and um as i started shooting uh concerts and things like that i just always loved the, the interaction between the crowd and, and the artists so that was re what really made me like fall in love with hip-hop was just just seeing artists perform live and kind of that connection but I, i've always been into like a wide variety of music so Originally, when Ozone started, it was very, um, we, we were based in Orlando. That's what Ozone stands for. And Orlando is very, a very diverse city. So you have a lot of uh, Caribbean people. You have a lot of Hispanics. So originally, Ozone was like all genres of music, like any type of concert that came to town. But at the time, you know, Southern rap was really, that was the movement. Like that was what was happening. And so we kind of gradually started covering a lot more of that. And that put me on to uh, a lot of artists I had never like heard of, even, you know, we're talking about the, the Pimp C book, even like UGK, that was never something that was on my radar, you know, growing up in Orlando until I started getting into the, the magazine. And then I started learning about the whole history and, and you know, all the groundwork that had been laid in order for the new, you know, the, the TIs, the little boosies, like the guys like that. The groundwork was really laid like long before they even came into the picture. So it was kind of interesting for me, you know, being sort of a, a historian or a journalist to kind of go back and learn like what had happened, you know, to, to prepare music fans for, for what was coming out next. Well, it appears that your journey with Ozone prepared you for what you're doing now. As you just gave mission to, you recently put out a book, Sweet Jones. Mm -hmm. is the life, uh, it talks about the life of Pimp C. Mm -hmm. Why Pimp C? What was it about Pimp C's journey or Pimp C's career that made you decide you wanted to document his life? Well, I knew Pimp. Um, he was a friend of mine. And I just felt like he, he, he was such an interesting character. Like any anytime you hung out with him, it was just going to be like a crazy adventure. And so I had the idea after he passed, you know, uh, that I felt like he his story was not very well documented. Like, And part of that was because of him, because he wasn't real big on doing interviews. And, you know, so there would be a lot of uh, kind of the myth of Pimp C. Like a lot of people have heard these, these stories and, and rumors, but no actual facts. Um, and I just thought he had a real interesting story. And. So when I first had the idea, I sat down and talked to his mom, who was actually his manager. They were very close, and his mom was, was just, um, once I talked to her, I, I just had to do the book because she just had so many great stories, and she could remember everything, and she was just a, an awesome resource to, uh, you know, to, to do a history book and to have somebody who was actually there and remembered, like, every detail. It was just yeah, I had to do it after I talked to her. <laughs> now, starting in Orlando or in the Florida area, as you gave mention to, and Pimp C being a, na a native of 
of Texas and having such a strong movement in Texas. When did you first hear about Pimp C? Were you were you already aware of Pimp C's movement and the whole UGK movement when you first initially started the magazine, or was it throughout time and actually getting more familiar with the Southern hip hop scene? Did you see the influence that he had? I mean, I, I think I didn't really understand the the real scope of the influence he had till I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. But um, I think I was like a lot of people because I I started getting into the hip-hop industry maybe 2002, 2003, and that was around the time that he went to prison. And so I think a lot of people, you know, the, the kind of generation that was coming up then, we would just hear, you know, free Pimp C, free Pimp C, and you're like, who, why, who is Pimp C, why should we free him? You know, so I, I think that um, Ozone kind of played a role in, in um, letting the new generation know, like, who he actually was, and he was a contributor to our magazine. Um, even while he was in prison, he did like a monthly, you know, he'd write in and we would we would um, scan the sheet and just include it in the magazine. And that was really my first exposure to him was, was while he was in prison. We, we started doing a section, it was actually called Prison Diaries. So we had different people write in. We had like C Murder, I think was incarcerated at the time. We had different, you know, people in prison who would actually write a letter to our readers. And the Pimp C letter that we wrote the first time, like we just got such an amazing, reaction to it, I was like, wow, people really want to read about this guy Pimp C. So, I mean, <laughs> if Ozone taught me anything, it was that people love to read about Pimp C. So, it only made sense to, to, to turn it into a book and, you know, a long form format. Now, I know, I know something like 700 pages, so it's, it's, it's a lot of details in the book, and I was able to uh, briefly glance the book earlier today. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about some of your favorite stories or, or uh, some of your favorite memories in writing the book, you know, some memories that you may have come across, like, dang, I didn't know Pimp, Pimp C had this dark side, or this is a very interesting story. Give us a few stories that really stick out in your mind. Oh man, there's there's so many. Let me let me think of a good one. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of real heavy stuff. There's a lot of um, uh, like for example, I'll give you a lighthearted example and, and and kind of a dark like not dark but like a heavy example. Um, the heavy on the heavy side, we talk a lot about the the rap a lot versus DEA situation, which people don't really understand how that relates to Pimpsey. I didn't know that that related to Pimpsey until I actually did the research, but. Um, at the time when he was arrested, he didn't want to go to trial because of the atmosphere in Houston at that time was very, he was affiliated with rap lot, he was basically at war with the local and federal authorities, and so he felt like if he went to trial that he would just be, you know, railroaded. Um, so that was part of the reason why he actually went to prison, so we kind of talk about the whole background to that situation. Um, and a lot of people have heard that he went to prison because he didn't do his community service, which is not exactly true, there's a little bit of truth to it, but the real reason he ultimately ended up going to prison was that um, he was going to be sent to a drug rehab program, which is like a six-month program. But the program does not allow for inmates to take medication. And he was actually diagnosed bipolar. He was, wow. he was on psychiatric medication, which a lot of inmates in Texas are. And they told him if he went to this program, he would not be allowed to take his medication. And he was so... Uh, I don't want to say dependent, but you know, his, his mom said he really couldn't function without it. Like he would just be extremely depressed and just wasn't able to function um, without being on psychiatric medication. So that was really the reason he refused to go to this program. They said, okay, well, you, you'll go to prison for eight years instead. Wow. So it, 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 stuff like that, I, f I found that to be, you know, that's deep. Um, just talking about the, the prison system in Texas, talking about mental health, um, talking about drug addiction. You know, he did have some issues with, with drug abuse, but his mom felt like that was more of a, a symptom. To It was kind of his way of trying to, to cope with his depression and other things that kind of had, had haunted him. So um, that those stories were very interesting to me. You know, and then on the lighthearted side, like, Pimp was a, he was a funny guy. Like, he was, he was just a comedian. So uh, there was one story where his, his engineer, like, he used to come to his engineer's house, like, just late at night. He would always want to record from, like, you know, midnight till 6 in the morning, whatever, and keep them up all night. But, um... He showed up one time in some, like, like eight hundred dollar jeans or whatever he had just bought, and his engineer was like, "Oh, this is you know nice jeans or whatever." And he said, "Oh, you like them?" And he just took them off and gave it to him and just walked out in his boxers and just <laughs> left. So like, Pimp was a he was a, he was a funny guy. There's a lot of funny little, you know, moments. If you got to hang out with him, he definitely was a uh, he definitely was a comedian. If I'm a young cat that's looking to get into the game and I need to do a little history on hip hop and really you know understand the the history of Texas's sound. Why would I pick up this book, or why should I pick up this book? I mean, there's a lot of good reasons, but the number one reason would be to to understand the business of the of the music game because Pimp and Bun, you know, really they really didn't. I mean, when they signed with Jive Records, they were I think 18, 18, 19 years old. Um, when they signed their first record deal, 
um, and, and Pimp described it as, as them being sheep headed to the slaughter. Like, they, they just were mm. completely green. They didn't know what they were doing. You know, they're, they're, they were actually signed to Big Time Records, which was a brand new record label. They were the first artists. So they really didn't have an understanding of what they were getting themselves into. And they didn't understand how to um, leverage their success because they had already sold 40,000 units independently in three months, which, I mean, even today that would be amazing. But at that time, like, that was unheard of. And they didn't really understand how to use that to leverage a better deal, you know, with, with a major record label. So for people who want to get in the music business, you know, you have to understand the numbers, the behind the scenes workings, or you're going to get, you're going to get fucked. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you could curse on here, but you're going to get <laughs> fucked. I mean, consider the fact that even after Pimp C died, UGK owes Jive Records $4 million. And UGK is a successful group that sold, you know, 500,000, 800,000 units every time that came out. So that can only be related to their contract. So if you don't understand where they went wrong, and, you know, somebody said that in one of the interviews, they said, well, the UGK story is, is really as much about their, you know, trials and tri tribulations and the mistakes they made as it is about their success. You know, it's all a part of their success. It's all a, it's all a journey. I mean, they had... You know, after Pimp C died, their former manager sued his estate for $5 million. I mean, they, and that's something that, that could have been avoided if he had paid a little more attention to some paperwork and, you know, things like that. So just kind of, even with his court case kind of, you know, in retrospect, like digging through all this paperwork, and, and it's easy for me to look through and say, well, he should have done this, or he could have, you know, if he had did this, things would have turned out differently. So for people who are getting in the music game, for people who are, you know, young kids in Texas, you know, Texas, one in three black men is on probation, on parole, or in prison. So if you want to avoid that trap, like, you have to understand, you have to be able to kind of go back and recreate, you know, what someone else went through and say, oh, well, he should have did this, and that's hmm. that's a lesson I can learn. So I think Pimba want, you know, people to, to take those lessons away, um, both with dealing with the music industry, dealing with um, the, the, you know, the criminal justice system. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned. So where can we go pick pick this book up? Where can we go, you know, for our audience and viewers that'll check out this interview, immediately following the interview, how can they go purchase the book? The best place is Amazon. Um, we're working on some other, it'll be in some retail stores as well soon, but oh, Amazon is the best go. place. Um, PimpCBook.com, we'll be posting updates on there. We'll be doing a book signing tour, so hopefully coming to your city, uh, wherever you are watching, hopefully coming to your city real soon. Um, Instagram, at PimpCBook, Twitter, at PimpCBook. Um, all my social media is at Julia Beverly, so you can follow us, and we'll be posting updates and tour dates and and all that stuff. So, very dope, very dope. Hip Hop since 1987 here with Miss Julia Beverly. Make sure you please pick up this book. It's a wonderful read. I'm going to be sure to pick it up. We we must we must continue to learn about our history. Pimp C did a lot for hip hop, and he's definitely definitely at the forefront for where hip hop is today. So make sure you support this young lady. Learn about our history and hip hop, and pick up the book. Hip Hop since 1987. Stay tuned for a lot more. Hip Hop since 1987.com.